Thanks, man. New York-based Sick Coalition is also here hosting this event. Um, we'd like to, first of all, thank Columbia University, Columbia University's SAVA group, the student group that has been so helpful in um, reacting and supporting and facilitating this event um, for us today. Also, the School of International and Public Affairs and the Earth Institute. We'd like to thank Jesse and um, Steve Cohen of the Earth Institute for helping to facilitate this event on such really short notice. Um, so as I mentioned, the event today, this news conference, is hosted by two SIC advocacy organizations who are working in partnership, SALDEF, the SIC American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and SIC Coalition based here in New York City. Um, coincidentally, there are two very timely research reports out of each organization that shows that what has happened to Dr. Prabhjot Singh on Saturday night is not an isolated incident, it's not an isolated act, um, unfortunately. Um, so we, here's how things are going to work today. I'm here really to facilitate and make sure that you all get what you need in terms of information and sound and pictures. Um, but we're gonna, we realize that everybody is on deadline and we're going to try to keep it as tight as we can. So you'll only hear from three people today. Um, Executive Director Jajit Singh, who's on your right here. Um, also, um, Amardeep Singh, who is the Program Director for the Sikh Coalition. And Dr. Prabhjot Singh uh, will speak after that. But each of them will take three to five minutes to talk about the latest research, and, and then we'll open it up to questions. And I'll be back. Uh, thank you, Brooke, and uh, thank you, members of the press, members of our community who are here. Um, my name is Jasjit Singh. Um, I'll spell it for you, J-A-S-J-I-T, last name Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Uh, you should just keep that last name uh, handy today. Um, and I'm the executive director of the SIC American Legal Defense and Education Fund, SALDEF. So thank you all for being here uh, with us today. It's obviously on, um, on an unfortunate uh, circumstance that we're all meeting here today, but it's also out of, um, I believe, concern for our community uh, as uh, New Yorkers and as Americans. Um, we have with us, of course, Prabh Jyot Singh, who's going to share his experience. But what I'd like to share with you today um, from the perspective of our national advocacy group is that Unfortunately, the, the sort of assault that Prabh Jyot Singh has faced is not something that we are terribly unfamiliar with. Uh, in the years after 9-11, our community has been unfortunately um, disproportionately targeted, whether it comes from challenges related to hate crimes, racial profiling, school bullying, or employment discrimination. Um, this community is no stranger to these types of incidents. In fact, just uh, two weeks ago, we released um, some research results uh, in collaboration with uh, Stanford University, uh, a report called Turban Myths, where we started to unwrap exactly uh, how big the challenge of uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions are as they relate to sick Americans. Now, we are the world's uh, fifth largest religion. There are about half a million Sikhs in this country. Uh, our beliefs are uh, around truth, uh, justice, service, compassion, uh, and in remembrance of uh, one God. Um, I think many of these are universal, um, universal uh, ideals shared not only by uh, most Americans, but uh, most humans. Uh, now, at the same time, although we know that this is what our faith stands for, we learned through this research that, in fact, our articles of faith in particular, uh, the turban and beard oftentimes, 
is causing uh, quite a bit of confusion. It's in fact uh, one of the big uh, takeaways from the research was that the number one figure that's associated uh, with the turban and beard amongst the average American is that of Osama bin Laden. Uh, think of that for a moment. The face of uh, violence and extremism, uh, terrorism over the last couple decades uh, is the face of our faith, which at its core, and as I said, is built upon compassion, loyalty, um, truth, and justice. Uh, so uh, if you'd like any additional information, I can share that after this press conference. Uh, about um, the turban myths research that was done with Stanford University. The other high level was that 70% of people do not know uh, who a sick American is. Uh, they don't know where we originate from, uh, what we believe, and of course, um, what we stand for. So we're working to uh, resolve that issue in partnership with uh, our friends at the Sick Coalition. And so I'll pass it over to Amradeep to share further. Thank you again. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me first um, just uh, express my condolences, uh, though I already have personally, but publicly uh, to Dr. Singh uh, uh, for what he uh, endured and, and, and really thank him for his um, you know, courage for being here uh, today. Uh, it's really um, uh, rare that we see uh, in our community that people feel comfortable uh, standing up uh, and speaking out as to their experience. Uh, Dr. Singh is going to speak soon, and he's, he's somebody that people uh, need to hear uh, to have a better understanding of what's happening here in, in this great city, New York City, and, um, uh, and around the country. My name is Amardeep Singh. That's spelled A-M-A-R-D-E-E-P. I'll be really disappointed if you can't spell, spell the word Singh uh, at this point, but it's S I N. Uh, GH, we note that three times is a charm, so you'll get it when Prabhjot Singh says his name. Uh, uh, the Sikh Coalition uh, is a New York City-based organization. We were formed the day after 9-11, uh, 12 years ago, uh, to combat uh, bias and discrimination uh, against uh, the Sikh community and to make our community more reflective of the e pluribus unum values uh, that um, uh, we are purport to represent. Uh, uh, and so I would say this, that what happened two days ago to Dr. Singh did not happen in a vacuum. Now, it's 12 years after 9-11, and yet I still find myself having to explain that I was born and raised in this country. I played Little League baseball. My mother was a soccer mom. I'm a diehard New York Yankees fan. I'm an American those conversations still have to happen. And so when I say this did not happen in a vacuum, consider this. In the last year, a sick motorist driving with his 13-year-old son was shot, was shot in a drive-by shooting in a random act of hate of what police locally in, in Sarasota, California, uh, Florida called a hate crime. In Fresno, California, in the past year, an 81-year-old uh, sick gentleman was beaten with steel pipes outside a sick house of worship in Fresno. In Washington, Seattle, Washington, in the last year, a sick cab driver was brutally beaten by a man yelling ethnic and racial epithets, the ones Prabhjot Singh, Dr. Prabhjot Singh heard two days ago, Osama bin Laden, terrorist. In the last two weeks, in the last two weeks in Chicago, a sick sitting in a restaurant was punched directly on, uh, on his turban by an angry patron. Here in this city, in New York City, on Wall Street, a sick walking, just simply walking, like Dr. Prabhjot Singh, had his turban knocked off by someone. It did not happen in a vacuum. Now, two weeks ago, we released a report about school bullying here in the city. It's called One Step Forward um, and Half a Step Back. It's about uh, the bullying of our children here in uh, New York City and Asian American the school children. What we found in our report, and this is fresh data, is that over 50% of our, the kids in our community suffer bias-based bullying. 
They're called bin Laden. They're called terrorists. They're called Taliban. Over 20 percent, over 20 percent as a price of maintaining their sick identity suffer violence, violence beyond bullying uh, on the basis of their sick identity. So, you know, my take home message is that what happened is uh, – is, um, it did not happen as a va- in a vacuum. And I'll conclude by saying this. Um, there is a combination of poor public policy, um, uh, crude media stereotypes, and, and little education in our schools that led to what happened uh, to Dr. Prabhjot Singh and what's happening in the Sikh community. So take, for example, a flight I took uh, last month to Oak Creek, uh, Wisconsin, where uh, a year and one month ago, Six members of our community were shot and killed in a sick house of worship by a man with neo-Nazi ties. When I flew on that airplane, the first thing that happened before I got on the airplane was that I was pulled aside for secondary screening, and what was searched? My turban was searched. And that experience is replicated 100% of the time at some of the airports around the country. And so what's the take-home message? If the government is fearing the turban, maybe the public should fear the turban as well. Take, for instance, the situation with Sikhs in our U.S. military. Sikhs are presumptively not allowed to serve in our military with our turbans on. Now imagine, and we know that Sikhs have a long history of military service throughout the world that's decorated. Now imagine the the, the perception if people saw a turban and beard and instead of seeing a terrorist, they saw a military hero. Take, for instance, that just this past Friday, I was in Pearson, uh, at Pearson Publishing in Boston uh, talking to a national textbook manufacturer about stereotypes about our community in school textbooks in this country. Do you know that if you read a, uh, a textbook by Pearson or McGraw-Hill or Houghton Mifflin, the number one thing you tend to learn about six is that six uh, uh, 40 years ago or 30 years ago were associated with violence in India. And that's all you learn about the world's fifth largest religion, uh, uh, period. And so we have a problem. We're going to need textbook manufacturers and school teachers to teach our children the right messages. We're going to need our government to end discrimination at the airports, to end discrimination at the military. And if we do those things over time, it will take a long time. We'll get to an environment where someone will be safe. They can walk down the street like Dr. Prabhjot Singh was doing two days ago, not be called terrorists, not be called bin Laden, and just enjoy some time out in this great city. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, um, for your support, support today, and thank you to Columbia University for hosting this. Um, first of all, I just want to mention that I'm really overwhelmed by the degree of support, hundreds of messages I've received over the last few days, um, and uh, it really matters a lot, and I really appreciate it, our family and community does. Very briefly, I'll, I'll mention uh, what, what happened. Um, I was walking with a friend after dropping off my one-year-old and my wife at our apartment. I live and work in... Harlem, um, and uh, was uh, passing a group of young men. Um, the police are estimating around 15 or 20. It seemed like a large group. And uh, I heard, get him, Osama. I heard terrorist. And then I felt somebody grab my beard uh, while on a bike, hit my chin. And what ensued was punching until I was ultimately on the ground. Um, in terms of injuries, I'm... Uh, very thankful that three bystanders intervened um, and stopped any further damage. Uh, my jaw is, lower jaw is fractured and was wired yesterday by a uh, oral surgeon. But as you can see, I'm here talking to you today um, and very thankful uh, for uh, that, it, that it wasn't any worse. I'd also like to say in terms of the actual event itself and its aftermath, uh, I've been working uh, with the NYPD hate crimes unit um, and uh, they've been handling this um, as seems like a priority and really appreciate their professionalism and support. Um, What happens to the people that uh, did this um, is in in their hands. Um, And I think it's worth uh, 
for myself and uh, at least my family to focus on other things. First, I just want to mention that I've lived in Harlem for two and a half years, New York City for 10 years, lived in multiple places. My parents came from Indianapolis here today. And um, it's really not the Harlem that I've gotten to know in the last few years through our community work. Um, and it's really not the face of our community. And when something like this happens, whether it's myself or to anybody else, um, I think it's critical to see that uh, this is really not the community that we expect, certainly not the country that we expect. And yet, we still have these bias attacks, bias-related crimes. Last year, I wrote in the New York Times about tracking hate crimes as an, almost as an academic. And this year, I feel very differently, certainly after Saturday, I feel a deep amount of empathy for all the other people who've experienced things like this, whether or not it makes the news, certainly for children that are bullied in schools and playgrounds, and certainly for the other woman, um, a Muslim who was attacked very shortly thereafter, which the NYPD is also looking into whether or not that's related. I sat next to her two beds down in the emergency department and got to know a little bit about her story and feel badly as one physician would for anybody that was in that position, and certainly as a fellow person. I'm uh, speaking today and why we brought this together with two goals in mind. One is to get back to the work that I think is so important, to looking at what a healthier community actually means in a substantive way at the community level, as we've been working on with number of institutions around the city with the Harlem community to really understand and work on what a healthier community looks like and means. That work's dearly important to me and as soon as possible I'd like to get back to it um, and plan on seeing patients tomorrow. The second reason is that I know there's a lot of interest in speaking uh, to me and hearing about various angles on this and um, I wanted to make sure that there was a consolidated focus for discussion so that you know, our, uh, myself, my family, uh, and the community can get back to doing the work, which I think is ultimately should be the focus of, of preventing, preventing events like this in the future. And finally, uh, I just want to express an enormous degree of love and support for the attacks in Westgate and Nairobi. It's where my parents were born. Uh, it's where my family, uh, where we grew up and my extended family lives minutes away from Westgate. And uh, some of my colleagues were there on Saturday, uh, and it's just incredible to hear, uh, and I want to just share from, from myself, certainly, just a deep, deep degree of uh, love and support for what's happening in, in Nairobi and Kenya now. Thank you. Doctor, what do you think about the, uh, the young teenagers who did this I think that it's absolutely critical that we go to their schools, we go to where they may congregate, we work with the community organizations, and we share and engage, ultimately. I want to live in a community where somebody feels comfortable asking me, hey, what's, what's on your head? Why, why do you have that beard? You know, what are you doing here? Are you American? I think we should be able to ask those questions. And I want to make sure that I live in a community where young men like that, instead of having to scream out and act out on a Saturday night, um, can engage and have learned about it some other way. Um, I have a young son, and he looks like an incredibly cute baby. And over the next many years, he'll increasingly look like a young, sick man if he chooses that path. And ultimately, I want to make sure that he has the tools of engagement and that he shares that with his friends in school and that we have the support not only of a sick community but for you know, Americans as teachers, as parents, that these sort of things are just not who we are. This is not an America that I recognize, and it's still not, even today. I think the bottom line is that I wanted to move as far away from 
uh, people that were uh, moving forward. There was a group mobilizing behind me. I ran as fast as I could away. And uh, I don't know what other people think about during these sort of events, but I wasn't thinking about very much. I'd say that, if anything, it makes me ever more committed to our community and redoubling our efforts there. Um, I, my area of work is community health and community health workers, creating opportunities for people while improving health in the long term. And I think that we actually need to broaden that discussion about mental health, how people fear, about psychology, about um, how, how people move around in the, in the community. It's not a Harlem I know. And it's certainly not going to change how I move around the neighborhood. Do you feel less safe in your neighborhood now? I don't know yet. <laughs> it's been two days. Um, I'd say that I've always known that as a city savvy person, there are certain places you should probably not head to, certain places that are fine. As a doctor, I end up seeing people in project housing. I end up seeing people in all parts of the city. And I will still go there. And, uh, and I'll still be received, I am sure, with the degree of welcome that I've experienced. Would you be willing to forgive the accused of this? Certainly. Uh, you know, I think that the bottom line is when you're 14 or 15, you pick up messages from all across the community. I think what we need to do is make sure who gave these kids a green light to hate and understand that it was okay to act out in this way. And so they're young men, and they will certainly, with the NYPD's work and the district attorney's work, I'm sure be quite afraid themselves over the next few days about what's going to happen. And ultimately, what happens is a legal process, but from my perspective, I think that there's more prior higher priority work to do. Not higher priority than the NYPD's, but for me personally. Yeah. Would you be able to identify any of your attackers or whether familiar to you? I hadn't. I hadn't seen any of them before. Um, I, actually, I don't know. I couldn't identify them. Um, it happened very quickly. It was dark. Uh, a lot of people moving, and uh, I conveyed the best that I could to the police department. And unfortunately. From myself, and it seems like the witnesses, uh, there isn't uh, any sort of sketches that are possible. Can you talk about the people who helped you out? Can you, tell, can you tell us who they are? And just talk about them in terms of, you talk a lot about community. Talk about them in terms of community as well. They're part of community as well. Hugely so, and I really have an enormous degree of <laughs> deep gratitude to those people who could have just walked by. Um, as I know happened sometimes in New York City, but didn't. There was a nurse who lived across the street um, as a, uh, recognized that I was also a physician and asked if how I was and moved things quickly. There was an elderly African-American gentleman who, when he moved forward, you know, told everybody to get lost and move and inquired to see how I was. And then there was another woman and another passerby uh, that lived right across the street. Uh, for them, uh, are they afraid of walking out of the street tomorrow morning? I don't know. But they were there, uh, and it was important, and I really appreciate it. Do you know their names? Um, I believe the NYPD knows their names. Um, uh, their names are known. Um, and I will, at some point, certainly uh, convey my deep gratitude towards them personally. Sure, um, and and only in brief, you know, I, I I work on some of these issues. My my focus again is, is slightly different. Um, there's a sensational aspect to this, and there's a painful aspect to this. Um, I think it's important that it's clear what they are. I was said, get him. Uh, you know, somebody yelled Osama. And I heard terrorist. My beard was pulled first uh, before my chin was hit. Uh, I had multiple people on bikes near me that were punching, and I was eventually down uh, with uh, punches to the jaw. 
after the initial uh, you, know, you know verbally mentioned things, uh, you know it was just purely physical and movement, and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's still clear to me what happened, um, but uh, any more detail than that, I'm sure I can leave it to your uh, plentiful imaginations. I think that the bystanders had a, uh, the witnesses or the in interveners had a critical role to play. Um, I couldn't possibly and wouldn't guess what would have happened, but I certainly felt some degree of peace that I may be unconscious within seconds, and I wasn't. And uh, I am sure that they had a role to play in that. Are there any updates on the attack? <clears throat> Not that I know of. I think those are for the. NYPD, uh, those questions. Is it you not like to get a good look at the attack because it happened so fast? Uh, how do you think the police are responding to it? Are there any, any footage? Have you been able to get any description at all of uh, who he was saying this There were multiple witnesses. Um, the NYPD is looking, trying to get as much information as they can. Um, you know, even before I think they call it uh, a hate crime, they have to make sure that everything fits with that. Uh, it certainly felt like it was motivated by my parents, but uh, it would be up, leave all those questions to them. I don't know. Dr. Singh, can you talk a little bit about the work that you do as a doctor and a teacher and in your community? Sure. The major past of my work over the last eight years has been moving all around the world to bring the best of low-income solutions innovations back to America. I think that, you know, we can cover people for health insurance, but we still don't necessarily know ways to really get to them, to reach them, and make them feel a part of their communities. And so I've spent a lot of time bringing some of these innovations, like community health workers, to places like Harlem, where jobs and better health are absolutely part of the future um, of the community. And so that's the work I'll continue to do, um, and it's what I'd like to certainly stay focused on and what I've received immense support to do from leadership all around, including community leaders. If you could say anything to the young man who attacked you now, if you could say anything to them, what would it be? My sense is that they would be under a bit of duress if I was talking to them at the moment. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I, I think it's probably pretty pointless to ask what was going through their minds, uh, probably not anything worth really conveying. I think I would ask them if they had any questions, <laughs> if they, you know, knew what they were doing, if they, uh, and maybe a bit of welcome, invite them to the Gurdwara where we... Uh, worship, get to know who we are, and then share it with their friends. You know, these are tight social networks. Everybody knows everybody. And so, you know, make sure that uh, they have up an opportunity to move past this as well. So that might be it for questions. Um, I, I want to make sure that everybody's questions are answered because there are a lot of people here and Dr. Singh has already given a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews and so we're not going to be doing that today. If you have any questions, please ask them now. Um, just a couple of things that we want to make sure get communicated and um, they've already been said but they're worth repeating that um, the Sikh faith is an independent religion. It's separate from other religions, and it was um, it originated in and around modern-day India about 500 years ago. Um, obviously, Amrdeep Singh of the Sikh Coalition has a lot of answers about bullying and kids and schools and what can be done there to improve education. It's important in this case because a lot of the perpetrators appear to be very young. Also, just with respect to Saldef's work in conjunction with Stanford University, um, some of the high-level findings are that 70% of Americans see a person in a turban and have no idea who they are, what they're about, um, tend to identify turbans and beards with Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and Shintos, and not necessarily Sikhs, even though 99% of the people in this country, the vast majority of people in turbans, are Sikh Americans. So this is an important thing for all of you to know because you can take this information away. You guys are reporters and you're 
disseminating information, so it really helps to have you in the know and aware of the facts about the Sikh religion. So if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask them now. Yeah. Do you think there's something that Sikhs in India can do as well to spread this message? Our own Prime Minister is a practicing Sikh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who wears a turban, and he's a Prime Minister of India. And this is something, uh, the message of which could possibly be carried forward in a more definite fashion. I, it would be hard to even begin to comment upon India's own situation and own history of just incredible ethnic violence and minority communities that are targeted constantly, repeatedly, yeah. massacres in Gujarat, um, and certainly all over the country. Um, I'd say that certainly applies to six in India that they should also continue to play a proactive role, and they clearly are if the prime minister is a sick man. Um, but I think ultimately we stand in solidarity. Um, uh, community here in America may be more tied to America, and that's the case here. I don't know India very well, but I know, uh, I know America pretty well. And so, you know, it would be great to have a dialogue further, but, but for now, I probably best not to give advice to what they should do. Walking west on one tenth and Lennox. At the inter I'm walking west on one tenth and Lennox. That's at the site of the incident. Still taking out your opinion piece NYP last year. Uh, do you think it's because the government here doesn't really classify uh, hate crimes against Sikhs in you know as a classification? It probably uh, you know makes Incidents like these even uh, more in here? Um, a lot's changed since I wrote that piece a year ago. Um, the FBI is formally including and disaggregating their hate crime statistics to include not only six, but other minority communities that need greater focus now. There's one question of tracking and surveillance. It's completely another question for real solutions at the community level. And that's not something that we can leave just to government. It's important that policies are in the right direction, but just as I've seen in my work as a poly, policy professor, the work is in the application of the community level. And so we have a lot of work to do with a lot of different people, and that's uh, what we'll continue to do. Can I just say something on the, the issue of um, what Dr. Singh would say to his attackers in, in his response, which I found very poignant but not surprising? Um, there's a... a uh, with the Sikh Coalition, the hate crime victims we've worked with here in New York City. Um, we've consistently found that Sikh hate crime victims here in the city, rather than um, wanting the system to engage in punitive measures to um, uh, go after the attackers, are more inclined, as it seems Dr. Singh is more inclined, to um, uh, uh, work towards education and uplifting the person who uh, committed the act to make them a better human being. This is consistent with uh, deeply held beliefs uh, in, in Sikhism in terms of forgiveness and the like. And, you know, Brooke had pointed out the point about educating people on our faith and our distinct beliefs. Uh, this is a distinct belief uh, that I think plays an important um, role in, in Dr. Singh's reaction to how he would react to the attackers if he met them uh, now. And you did say you Um, we have we have multiple in the area, some in Queens, um, and we have one in Manhattan, uh, which we've just been getting together. We're a small 30-something community, 30-something-year-old community that's trying to get together space to actually worship regularly in the city, and so that's a bit downtown. Um, and if, whenever we have something that's a bit more stable, we'd love to have them there, and certainly in Queens and all over New Jersey, there are other opportunities. Dr. What injuries did you, you talked about your jaw, what other injuries did you suffer? <coughs> the primary injuries were to my lower jaw, um, and then just bruising on my torso, um, and then a uh, relatively small puncture wound in my elbow. I think as a physician, uh, it seems like as a breed we minimize, um, and uh, you know, I think the fact that I can talk to you today uh, 
certainly conveys a sense that I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, and I really, again, appreciate all the questions about my personal injuries. Doctor, I wanted to ask you, you're saying that um, there are questions that you would have been happy to answer regarding your beard, your turbans. What are some of the stereotypes or, or something to clear the air that you can um, tell us right now that you would like to convey about your turban and your beard? Well, I'll tell you uh, a stereotype that I'd love to see emerge over the next 20 years when hopefully my son is 20 years old. My father used to always tell me in Nairobi and Kenya, whenever you saw uh, a man in a turban and a beard, a sardar as they're called, you knew you could just call for help. You could ask them to do anything. You could ask them to move groceries for you or if there was an attacker on the street or anything. I hope that in hopefully not 20 years, but over the next few decades or you know, few years, we can move to a point where you see a person in a turban and a beard and the exact opposite reaction emerges of fear and recognize that that, sick, that turban and beard sitting next to you on a plane may be your first line of defense and the first person to jump into a line of trouble um, for you. As we have done in the military across the world, here in the United States, and just on a regular person-to-person -person level uh, in, a, in our communities. I think that's uh, a core teaching. You see this face and look for help. That's what we're here to do. Thank you. One more. One more. Can I just ask, as your students and colleagues, what would you suggest that we can do to support your community and to spread awareness? We are looking to help, and we're just having those guidelines to help. First of all, just a great amount of gratitude for the students that did come today. Um, and I know that many others tried to. I think that your work that you do as people that are working in low income areas across the country and world is the primary work that needs to be done. It fundamentally is about engagement. It's fundamentally about breaking down barriers between things that cause violence and I'd say keep on doing your good work. Uh, and uh, you'll certainly see all the opportunities as they come up. And it's not just about six. It's really about a you know, broader question about where are we going as a people. You've heard me say this in, uh, in our class classes. And that's the, men the message. Continue doing what you're doing and, and make sure you stay true to who you are in the process. Thanks again so much for coming. Here's what we're going to do, you guys, just, um, just to give Dr. Singh a clear path out. If you could just clear the way over here, please. And he can walk out. You can get some pictures of him on the way out. If, as long as you guys stay low in front so that the cameras are back, you get some pictures of him walking out. But then Amardeep Singh here and Jajdeep Singh will be available for questions afterwards. Can you guys please get down so that the cameras in the back have a shot? Oh, yeah. Dr. Singh is the end of the